Happy November, everyone. So great to see everybody. Yay. Take time to look at everybody, each other, because it's um, letting yourself be held by the Sangha. And holding. Yeah. Mm, good to see you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> mm. Ready? Ready, Jesse? Everyone? Okay. How does your body awareness experience the surface of your skin right now? The shape, form, contours, sensations, little pressures. pulsations, vibrations. Around your head and face, around your hands, around your feet. How is the body sensitivity receiving the stream of imprints of texture, hard, soft, smooth, granular, silky, grainy. How does it, how does it experience your sense of the body holding itself upright, firmness, stiffness, tension, the physical tension. And light or strong variations of pressure, movement. certain areas felt through body awareness that feel like a, a, a ball of pressure, cohesion, an air element, or a clump 
of hardness, water and earth, If the body's sensations are music, what are you hearing? Side by side with the body awareness, stream of sensations or collection of certain elemental nature, pressures, heat, side by side, do you notice any mental moods, emotions, mental states, maybe they correlate with the sensations, maybe they're quite a contrast. As, a, as an experiment, focusing awareness around the solar plexus or heart center, What sensations are being experienced? Are they strong or soft? Pleasant, unpleasant? Neutral? Any mental moods as you feel sensations in this area? Right there on the surface as awareness feels this particular collection, formation of sensations at the solar plexus. Maybe it's a sense of a little above the surface. As if heat is radiating out and a certain emotion or mental quality as well seems to be emanating out. warmth or tenderness, fear or anxiety, more neutral states, contentment, equipoise. Checking as well just below the surface. Is there an undercurrent, barely perceptible stream of physical sensations or mental qualities of the heart? a cluster of sensations. Above the surface with the radiation of, of warmth and perhaps a pleasant feeling tone that has the, the taste of metta, friendliness, compassion, care.
it's possible for some of us just under the surface, a current of vague or medium or strong despair, anxiety, fear that we hold at bay, covered by a layer of neutral feeling tone, perhaps equanimity, perhaps indifference. Your, your wisdom can discern can make the distinction. Here it's just to observe, not to change, just to know what's there at the surface, a mist just above the surface, undercurrent beneath the surface. What happens if the aim of preconceptual mindful awareness goes right for the core to the center of a sensation, of an emotion, of a mental state? Is there anything there? Is there any felt sense experience at the core of a cluster of sensation, a mental quality, fear, tenderness, curiosity? restlessness. Can you feel the physical and the mental ephemeral phenomena intertwine, interrelate? having no sense of any direction, going anywhere. Like listening to musical notes, like listening to a symphony, leaning back in the moment, receiving. Receiving all the stream of arising phenomena, just the way it is, just the way it presents and displays. Seemingly right at the surface point are floating slightly above the surface or as an undercurrent. Like a deep earth spring of water. What bodily system comes naturally as a home anchor, as a place to abide being aware of phenomena streaming along, rising up, having a presence disappearance. Which bodily system 
is that the body itself from head to toe, a global awareness of the body from within the body, body awareness aware of itself, not from the head, not filtered through analysis, interpretation, conceptual lenses of any kind, when they arise, they're part of the awareness domain as well. You just notice that particular lens, seeing the body through a thought formation or series of thoughts. as you let yourself relax more into the bodily system of the anchor, do those filters recede? And it's just the direct awareness of bodily nature from within the body. Or perhaps if the breathing system whose motion awakens millions of particular elemental natures of pushing, pressures, propelling, tightening, peaking firmness with an in-breath at the abdomen, and then a release relaxing, depressurizing, softening sensation with the out breath. Is there a sense of feeling safe harbor or security with the familiar nature of our, of our home anchor, the body, the breath. Sometimes sound is an immediate and secure, dependable anchor. We just abide receiving sound vibration, aware of the stream of hearing. Just depending on conditions, this particular si sitting Maybe it, it will remain feeling close, close at hand and simple, just the body, just the home anchor. Maybe some of that warmth that you felt earlier, friendliness, tenderness. Also not forgetting, not pushing away if there was an undercurrent of anxiety, fear, despair. As long as we keep it held in awareness, keep it within our home domain, our ancestral home of things to be aware, that fear, that despair, that anxiety, usually will not overwhelm due to the nature of the disidentifying and non-attached nature of mindful awareness. is connecting with the phenomena of that mind state, 
the meta warmth, the conditional nature of it, the unease of anxiety, tightening of fear, but it's, it's okay to be exactly what it is when there's not a push or a pull, not trying to hold on to the metta, not trying to reject the anxiety. Immediate felt sense, touching it, the body awareness, touching both the physical sensations and the mental characteristics and nature. Of the pleasant mind elements, mind emotions, qualities or unpleasant ones. And physical sensations, some neutral, barely perceptible, some a little painful or more painful. Just getting to know that as it is, and where the sensations are light and tingly, often we pass over their pleasant nature. Part of mindful investigation of phenomena is pausing at times to recognize those subtle, pleasant sensations physical or mental, abide knowing their pleasant nature. Not with clinging, just with the sensing, feeling, knowing. Feeling perhaps fed by the nectar of those Dhamma pleasures, felt sense, pleasant mental or physical, elemental nature.
in the last minutes of the meditation. Just making a, an imaginary mindful space in the area of the heart center. And using the, the parami of aditant, our resolve, the gentle request to our Dhamma system. May the Brahma Vihara most beneficial. to me at this time arise. No expectation, the anchoring in the area of the heart center in that receptive, open, receiving manner and What's the felt experience? No need to identify. Brahma Viharas know what they are within themselves. We don't need to run it through the intellect. Let's see what the inclination of heart is. Connection, care, appreciation, balance or equipoise. Notice how some by innate nature abiding in them seem to self-extend and others abide inwardly as our own systems drink their nectar, heal, be held, be inspired. Thank you for your instruction, Stephen. Can everyone hear me? You can hear me okay?
right? Uh, there is a great journal of Henry David Thoreau's wildflowers and um, living in the north uh, as, as you shift from September, October till no, to November, uh, you can see he's um, shifting to finding, uh, you know, more trouble finding little uh, alive flowers as uh, winter is coming and the frost comes or the snows. And um, I just wanted to read you a very short passage as it's November 1st. This is from November 1st, 1858. A person dwells in their native valley like a corolla in its calyx like an acorn in its cup. Here, of course, is all that you love, all that you expect, all that you are. I think that we um, are very fortunate to live in a time where we can contemplate our native home as the Milky Way or our planet and have a gift of being able to see our planet visually from space or to understand um, ourselves wherever we live as part of uh, ecosystems or countries or uh, eventually towns and cities or valleys or you know a little teeny tiny <laughs> room that we might might live in it's like and then the meditation practice like as Steve was instructing it's like our our native home that we tend actually not to be as interested in is our the vast range of physical sensations and sounds and emotions, thoughts, um, smells, tastes, touch the six sense doors and uh, that flow, them not being ours. They're, they're not being possessing this um, flow of sensations thoughts, memories, it, all of this six sense to our um, moment to moment awareness that's so fleeting that that is our native home. So for example, fear or peace or anger or happiness that this sound, whether we uh, find them pleasant or unpleasant or whatever sitting here and maybe um, sleepiness comes or restlessness or doubt that this range of experience is all part of our home, who we are. And really the courage it takes really the incredible courage it takes to explore that range of experience. And when we get attached to any particular state of mind to remember that it's impermanent, right? To be, be able to see that it, it takes um, great courage to not be attached to what we want, the comfort we want or the particular outcome of uh, a situation or how we might get caught in an expectation of how our sitting should be or what the talk should be about or whatever, whatever. It's like uh, the courage, we have to remember the courage it takes to see how easily we get attached to 
what we want to be happening versus what is happening. I, I hope we've all, a lot of it ha has, have had the opportunity to, to appreciate the blue moon that we've had the second October full moon. And as we um, journey through this amazing time, I just find this time of shifting from the, in the Northern hemisphere, the shifting from the um, summer and the, all the light and, and as each day goes by and it gets darker earlier, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the darkness that we can appreciate how beautiful the light is of the moon more than more than ever than in the summertime. And where I live often, uh, one can see fleetingness and impermanence in the, in the surface of the ocean. Uh, it's, it just feels like it's uh, almost never still. I have a, um, one of the three feral cats um, that live around me. Um, her name is Christofferson. And she tends to be the one that roams a lot more than the other two. She roams a lot. But uh, around sunset, she comes by and she wants so much. She just scratches at the door and wants so much uh, for me to take her just just the little ways up the driveway and, and see the sunset. Or if I'm running late to look up at the stars, she, it's just, it's her most happy time of day, She I think, <laughs> at least that I notice with me. Um, uh, and that often I'm super busy and super busy at the time and I hear her scratching and it's like, I know if I go with her, I'll be grateful. You know, I know it, but I'll often not do it. And this particular night, two weeks ago exactly, was a new moon, very busy, didn't want to go. And um, she just kept insisting. And once in a while, I listened to that because often she's right. She's often right that I should come out. And I went out and the ocean was, I've never seen it before like that. I don't necessarily expect I'd ever see it again like that, but completely still. And it was a little later than usual that I went out and it was so still. And I actually could see, um, you know, Jupiter is starting to go set early now. And at Jupiter was starting to go down. And I could see the wake of the light of the planet Jupiter. Uh, and I've never even remotely considered that was a possibility, <laughs> never mind that I would witness it. And I think that these. Um, these combinations of conditions sometimes are so uh, extraordinary, in some ways magnificent uh, and rare. And I could just see, be with that experience as the, the, that um, stillness, the stillness, which is the metaphor that I'm getting across tonight, that the, and the darkness, that without that new moon, the condition of that darkness and that, um, really no more summer the darkness it wouldn't have happened but the and, and jupiter setting that that combination of conditions created um, such a, a beautiful magnificent inspiring vision and i i feel like there are times when i just i'll see something like that and get the power of stillness and, and i find that as things get more turbulent in the world, and this week particularly, <laughs> you just feel like, whoa, what's, what's going to happen? And um, this next week, uh, and I'll feel myself not wanting to go deep inside. I'll feel, I'll feel like that resistance to stillness. Um, it's almost like I can't bear, like, getting so still and quiet and then jumping back into the turbulence. It's, it's like, and I'll, I'll find that something like that experience of the magnificence of, 
us being on this planet and our native home, including Jupiter and the, this darkness, this exquisite darkness and, and the possibility of always something new, um, inspiring. And it, it, it's like, it, it inspires me to practice when my mind isn't still, you know, or when I don't want to, or I can't bear that knowing that I might get a quiet and equanimous and then maybe a half an hour later, the equi equanimity is gone. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not there. Yeah. So, um, And I wanted to um, read a poem, a little poem from Kobayashi, Kobayashi Isa, who is one of the greatest haiku poets of Japan. He lived 1763 to 1827 as a kind of um, reminder of how the opposite of that experience I just shared can be. It's a haiku. As old age arrives, considering just the day's length can move one to tears. I'm not so sure you have to be really old to experience that, but I think as you get older, you can really relate to it for sure. But as old age arrives, considering just the day's length can move one to tears. And I, you know, just that again, the mindfulness practice, the wisdom practice, the Brahma Vihara practice includes that dread, that just dread of like getting through a day and not having any sense that something magnificent or beautiful may ever happen again, right? There's that range of experience um, and the Buddha taught that we can get a relationship of wisdom, kindness, compassion, empathetic joy and equanimity with all of it. So we are in that period again that's considered very sacred of sh the shift from the light to the dark. And it's very helpful to remember that the insight practice is really about uh, connecting and understanding truth universal truth, truth um, that comes from this non-conceptual awareness that she was talking about, that like we apply the, the mindfulness and the energy, the concentration, that we, we attempt to connect our attention with something real and true, not, not a fabrication, not a memory of what might have been two seconds ago, but just receiving something just in the moment, um, just as it is, not how we want it to be, just as it is. And uh, as we, uh, most of us know that the first understanding that, that really is so fundamental and important is understanding anicca, impermanence. And that the, the sense of the momentariness of life and the fleetingness of it is um, the constant and unavoidable change is uh, this first truth of existence that we all share. And, and I think that it's always important to be reminded of the sense that when we're connected with this truth, when we really are accepting this truth and understanding this true truth, we're protected. And this isn't like a, a, 
a child, a, a, like a wishful thinking kind of safety or protection. And this is so important. It's not like um, the protection is something that protects our, us from how things are. It means that we're, we're protected because we understand how things are. And actually, we want to understand how things are more and more. That we, as we see this, we start to get that we want to understand Anicca more and more. So it protects us as we age and others age. And again, it's not, or it's not like we get protected from more pain. <laughs> it means that we're able to connect with however things are happening, whether there's pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. And, and so of, of course that reminder also that the, the mindfulness is being um, Suzuki Roshi defined mindfulness as soft readiness. That's so again that importance of getting that the soft readiness means that we're ready for anything to happen. And like, for example, this week, are we ready for anything to happen? Well, it's intense, right? Do Are we really ready for anything to happen? I, the other day, I thought, well, maybe I can sleep through this. <laughs> maybe I can just wake up November 12th and not have to really see what is going to happen, right? Like, it, I thought that sounded great, you know, but of course, I'm not going to do that. But it was tempting. You know, sometimes anything can happen is no fun. You know, it's just like, okay. But, you know, I can keep seeing myself tempted to kind of create something catastrophic or something like, okay, it's going to be you know, not like what I could imagine, it's going to be fine. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine, right? Like watching myself go through that, you know, again, that range of catastrophic to, oh, it's going to be a piece of cake, it's all going to go according to the, what we want. And, and then kind of just kind of finding again, that place of soft readiness. We don't know what's going to happen next. And that fle the flexibility of that. And, and not, um, I think I'm hoping I'm getting across, not judging that the thought came up that I wanted to sleep through it, right? Or that the catastrophic uh, vision or the uh, Pollyanna vision, or, you know, it's like not, I don't, I, I feel like what I'm trying to say is that the teaching is that we connect with all of it, right? That we, we're not trying to control the way we're relating to what's happening, of course, this range of experience will come up in relationship to not knowing what's going to happen. And uh, the, again, the reminder that this, the readiness means anything can happen, and that, that when we're connected to that, we're protected. And the, the soft readiness is a, it's that we will hear Steve or Jesse or I talk about a tender awareness, yeah, a vulnerable awareness. And that, that all comes in that range of softness that, that um, it's experience moment to moment change is like water. It's just streaming, flowing. This is from um, the poet Saigyo, Japanese poet who lived 1118 to 1190. Uh, he wrote a lot of poems about autumn. All so vague. In autumn, the reason why, sorry, all so vague. In autumn, the reasons why all fall away. And there's just this inexplicable sadness. Saigyo was and is a very beloved poet because um, 
he really connected with difficult emotions. And I think that that it's so clear, you know, that you can see how we all do this. We all try to find reasons for whatever we're feeling, right? We, we try to come up with ways to uh, understand maybe why we're sad as a way to avoid the sadness. And I think often when we can just say, oh, you try to let go of that defense of thinking about it and just, oh, oh I'm just, I'm sad. It's, it's the sadness, it's okay. And you can go from it feeling personal to universal. It's just the sadness. And that of course, at times our heart, if we're connected to life and we're not indifferent, that the heart will hurt at times. So to hear this again in autumn, in autumn, the reasons why all fall away. And there's just this inexplicable sadness. Um, autumn is that time of noticing this incredible change from summer to winter. And of course, sometimes we get sad. So uh, again, that reminder that the practice includes um, the song of the birds and when the birds fly away, <laughs> or like the, um, a good night's sleep and sleeplessness, you know, times when there's no pain in the body to so much pain in the body. This, that, again, that, that range of change. I have a, a family member that's been having a number of panic attacks and there, there's a lot of good reasons why she's having them. Um, and uh, it's been interesting for me trying to offer a way to be helpful knowing that we both come from um, kind of a, I always joke with her that it's like 10 or 20 generations of an anxiety disorder <laughs> without anybody acknowledging it, you know? And um, so we've been going through a number, it's either phone calls or texts. And um, I, I really will try to say, um, knowing how to, Knowing how to work with fear is actually very hard for me too. It's like, I think that she'll get the sense that she's all alone with it and that it's only her that's wanting to go to the ER every day because she thinks she's going to die from it, you know? And so um, it's been very helpful for me to attempt to be articulating kind of a simplicity of how to work with the fear in such an acute situation for her and it's it's really been interesting because it's it's um i've had to be very strong at times with really trying to cut through in terms of um you know you can talk to this person you can do this you can do this you can but it's like i said eventually you're going to have to get a relationship with the fear and, you know, I could feel that kind of going over, like, not well. Like, it, I would feel the kind of, like, kind of, no, let's, yeah, let's go in a different direction. But yesterday, I thought, no, you know, I've got to, like, I have to actually kind of really drive this in. I can't be soft about it anymore. And I really went at it, but very kindly, you know, and I was just like, if you had a two-year-old little girl that was experiencing this panic, 
what would you do for her? And she kept trying to go around it and get away from it, kind of like with all the, you know, reasons why and all this and that. And I'm like, no, it's like, what would you do for her? And I said, it's not rocket science. It's so simple. And finally, she's like, I would pick her up and hold her. And I said, who is picking up you, her up and holding her right now? Who's doing that? Who am I asking to do that? And she's like, me, you're asking me to do it. Like, I said, mostly when we're in that place, we want someone else to do it. And it's fine. It's okay to want someone else to do it. But I'm telling you, you've got to learn to do that for yourself. And you got to start as soon as possible. And then I didn't get a text for a really long time. And I was like, okay, this is it, you know? And then I got a text, it was so funny. I got a text and I just got one word. I think it's a word, UGH, U-G-H, UGH. I got an UGH for like, and then another one. And, and she said, then I got two words, you're right. And then another hour, UGH. And then another the word, you're right. And then she wrote again an hour later, um, I'm going to keep rereading this. I think I need to keep rereading this. And then I tried to write out something again. Like every time you disconnect from that fear, you're abandoning that little kid. And she's all alone. And that's what, and and then I tried to tell her what I said. This took me forever to learn. It's like you learn this, I learn this. This is like this goes back for so far in our history. Like it's like we learn it, very hard to unlearn it. But I said, you know, your body is screaming at you to change your relationship with this. And I know it's not going to be easy for her because it hasn't been easy for me. And I have a lot more resources than she does. And it's been very powerful because I see, oh, there's so much trust between us, really. And we're, we're going somewhere. But I think that everybody that's listening to this knows how hard it is. And for, for somebody, it might not be fear. Like, it, it, it's not just fear. It could be something totally different like anger or it could be loneliness right it could but we all have something we learned to run away from and running away from it can look like we're fine running away from something can look like i'm fine there's no problem because indifference indifference and being okay with something can look the same from the outside But from the inside, it, it's a huge difference. It's like being connected with something is very different than disconnected from it. And the relationship with whatever is difficult is it comes from that willingness, <laughs> the willingness to feel something painful. So it's easy for me when I'm not having trouble with fear to, to say to my, my family member, you know, fear is okay, right? I know fear is okay, but when fear isn't okay <laughs> and you're experiencing it, it's a bummer, right? It's hard to get that part of our awareness that can go, oh, maybe I could try to be interested in this when the conditioning is so strong not to, that something really isn't okay. You know, so it's, but it's like this, I think that as we disconnect from something as a pattern over and over again, it makes us weaker and weaker and it gives the pattern more and more strength. And uh, I know that you all know that all of us teach, we offer that you're not, we're not saying go into something that's difficult over and over and over. It means that you do it sometimes and get strengthened by it. You learn how to get a relationship of wisdom, discernment, kindness with it. And when we can't, it's okay not to. 
you know, I was giving her all kinds of options, you know, of what to do if she can't be with it. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. That's part of what's so important. The other, um, last week, someone asked about how to, um, you know, at this time period, I think with a lot of the politics, how do you send or feel metta for someone really difficult? And um, I, I thought back to the first time I did a long metta retreat with Sayada Upandita. It was two, two months. And in two months of working with him and seeing him every day, not once did he ask me to work with a difficult person for two months. And then he asked me if I would come back the next year and do another long retreat. And I said, yes, but it, and then I did another two months the next year. And a month into it, he asked me to do a difficult person. Now, what did I learn from that? That I was hopeless at metta? <laughs> no, I could have. I, of course, many times I thought that, that, oh God, he's never gonna ask me to do this. But it was like more like I started realizing that he was offering me the opportunity to see that you can't force it. You can't force metta for a difficult person. You can't expect yourself to feel it if it's not there, but you can build up metta and keep building it up with what's easy and keep building it up with what's easy and keep what's building up with, with what's easy so that when you try someone difficult or some being, that if you can't do it, there's no problem. You go back to easy. You have cultivated that so deeply that you don't take it personally. You know that the metta is not strong enough. It's not personal and that it's okay. And I think that's so important for us all because I think a lot of the kinder, caring people think that the more think they should be able to when actually it's okay when we can't and then the other part is that I started playing around with it this week um, and I, I, um, I am very interested in the quantum world and I started shrinking the, the beings that are so difficult like I shrunk them so small they would disappear and then I kind of made them like so almost infinitesimal that it was much easier to feel mad <laughs> for them. And I'm not kidding. It's like it's working quite fun and well. And um, but I don't push it. Uh, so I, I, I would what I'm trying to offer in this way is that with the same with the whole talk is that you want to try to make the connection, but you can't control it. And there will be times when you can and you strengthen there and then you back off and you, you hopefully are strengthening your loving kindness or your compassion or mudita or the equanimity with what you can do and stretch, stretch there, keep stretching there. This isn't a whole talk about um, practicing with the difficult beings in the Brahma Viharas, but I wanted to offer that. I'm not saying you should shrink beings into infinitesimal. If that, if that isn't um, helpful, don't do it. But I'm saying try to be creative. You know, if you have a whole sea full of fish, like thousands and thousands of fish, maybe make one of those beings one of those fish. That's all I'm saying. That's what Steve suggested, a group. But maybe you don't make it a group of like all the worst beings that you can think of. Um, you try to bring, you know, a, an expanse to it or, or uh, something that makes it possible for the heart to, to soften rather than harden.
someone had mentioned to me this week that they didn't feel worthy of truth. Uh, so I found a quotation from Sri Nazargadatta that um, Sri Nazarga Maharaj from the book I Am That that I thought touched into that we're all worthy. Uh, so I'd like to end with that, this quotation. Truth is not a reward for good behavior, nor a prize for passing some tests. It cannot be brought about. It is the primary, the unborn, the ancient source of all that is. You are eligible because you are. You need not merit truth. It is your own. Just stop, just stop running away by running after. Stand still, be quiet. So the encouragement this week is to, to keep valuing some quiet, uh, even though it might be uncomfortable to shift into it or the stillness. Uh, All the blessings come from it, so. Um, I guess it's time for any questions anybody might have. Looks like uh, Kim has a question, but um, yeah. she can't see her hand raised. But are you there, Kim? Hi, can you guys hear me now? Hi, Hi Michelle um, and everyone. Um, something I've been struggling to reconcile with is, you know, just my responsibility as a person of social and economic privilege, and. Um, you know, how much can I enjoy, you know, material things or like a nice meal or something, um, you know, when there's like people on the street in San Francisco that like are looking for like 50 cents, you know. <laughs> um, I was at a women's retreat yesterday and this nine-year-old girl shared her journal entry and, and her first question was, is my life for me or for others? And I just like burst into tears. I was like, oh my God. Um, and I know, you know, I, I feel like I, I can only give to others when I fill my own cup first, but, you know, trying to be aware of like, when I want to do something, is it coming from greed? Is it coming from, you know, grasping for pleasure and things that are impermanent, like, and don't really matter? Um, you know, like how much am I allowed to enjoy? <laughs> Um, and, and how much, you know, cause it always feels like I, I could do more, I could do more, I could do more. Um, so any, anything you have to offer about that? Mm. Well, I can start. I think Steve might have 
something in my, okay, I don't have to. Um, I think the first thing to always look at is when we're motivated by a kind of guilt or duty that it's important to be, bring the awareness and connect with that rather than um, get caught at that point in action, you know, because um, there's a way that you can add like an unhelpful self-hatred to a kind of privilege that um, isn't actually helpful. It's, um, there's a kind of unfathomableness to the growing gap between people who have and people who have not, and it's horrendous and um, not acceptable. And it hurts the heart terribly. And that, it, that you can let it, hurt your heart is really important that you feel that um, the pain of it is so important and and let um, let that understanding that this shouldn't be a allowed to happen you know but it is happening so there's that the, the paradox of getting that it's not acceptable it's not okay and then the equanimity is really so that's the compassion is really caring about it wanting to do something about it that's not guilt that's not duty that's getting that we we feel this great care and also the equanimity is facing that you're limited we're all limited we can't feed everyone um we can accept that hunger is happening to the extent that it is and that it's not okay, but to, to, to be effective requires the equanimity. And then pick, <laughs> choose, choose what you feel like you can do. You know what I mean? Like there is so much suffering. <laughs> There's no, none of us can attend to all of it. That is the truth. But we can do an honest self-assessment, whether it's daily or weekly or in our lifetime, what we dedicate ourselves to, and really um, not have that come out of guilt, but to come out of real uh, the compassion and wisdom, you know, and I think that we're, a lot of us will be called to do more, but it doesn't mean you have to um, not accept the comfort that you do have, you know, in some ways, <laughs> um, that comfort can can actually protect you from so much pain that you will have the energy to help. If you see it that way, you'll understand that. You'll understand that if you were on the street trying to get 50 cents, you wouldn't be that helpful either. But you could be there. <laughs> You could be there next year. None of us should be like thinking that, you know, it, it can't change. That could be you. And that's why you care. You know, we're all that connected and um, we all have different capacity, but certainly it's so moving. It's so moving to me that you're asking that and um, that your heart hurts in the face of this is important. It's, it's, it's joyful. <laughs> it's joyful to hear you say this, it's important. And I don't know if you have any questions about that, Kim. I can't hear you. Yeah, no, that's that's helpful because I have been feeling a lot of guilt and I have always felt like guilt is a useless emotion. It's like I can use it in as much as I can learn something from it. But more than that, it's just kind of like suffering, like you're saying. It's a self-hatred. It's self-hatred. 
I mean, you can feel remorse. We can feel for remorse for not helping people enough. That's different than guilt is like flagellating yourself and it's de-energizing. Remorse can be um, energizing and you, you make a commitment to do better. You know, that's different. But it doesn't mean that you can't have any pleasure. <laughs> that's getting all twisted you know, it gets twisted and that it doesn't mean you can't enjoy a good meal. It means that maybe you think, oh, I need to help um, someone get some more food the next week as a balance. Do you see the difference? Yeah. Yeah, out of care. You don't want to stop caring about yourself to care for others. And this is never easy. I'm, I'm not, I hope I'm not making it this sound easy. It, it's, it's not an easy thing. It's a lifetime of um, self-assessment. And certainly I think, again, in these times, we're gonna hopefully uh, hear it's like, you know, Kuan Yin, the, Kuan Yin hears all the laughter in the world and all the cries of the world, right? She hears both. And try to, try to remember that, that it's not the Kuan Yin, the, the goddess of compassion. She hears all the cries and the suffering of the world, but she hears all the joy and the laughter. And, and I really encourage you to um, make that a practice every day. Without that joy, you often don't have enough energy to hear the cries and are, are you're able to do something about it. There's what they call burnout. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Stephen Michelle, do you see Carolyn's question? Yeah. The... Steve, do you want Steve, do you want to start on that? There's a question. Do you a, see it? She put a question in the chat box that everyone should be able to see. Do you see it, Steve? Uh, I uh, just found it. Okay. <clears throat> the question is about grief and tips for dealing with grief having just lost uh, her her dad a few months ago and coming out of a two-year relationship, finding it difficult to sit with grief at times. Is your background so noisy that you can't respond to the question, what is your experience with sitting with grief? Okay. Can you, can you speak or do you have to answer in chat because that's what I would ask what what do you sit with what happens when you um, are you overwhelmed by grief is grief okay is, is it a okay emotion for you can you differentiate grief moments from from caring moments can you care for the grief care for yourself, feeling grief, care for the feeling of experiencing loss. And Michelle was talking about the difference between Nietzsche and Anicca, permanence, impermanence. Uh, we, we all want to feel good and continue feeling good and would feel good all the time um, if we had that control. So we don't have that control. Uh, so it's helpful to 
to realize that like understanding endings, loss, um, impermanence is a, is a very powerful insight into how to handle life as it is, which is really a series, a series of losses. At any one moment, as Michelle was just uh, talking to Kim about, we have to feel what our limitations and capabilities are. It's wisdom to work within that, within that pasture of capability and limitation, not doing more than we can uh, and not coming up short of what we're able to do. Uh, so to, to feel lost to the extent with which we don't feel washed away by it, carried away by that emotion. Um, and what tools are helpful to that, which Brahma Vihara, uh, as I suggested at the end of the sitting, what Brahma Vihara seemed, if you made the space for it, seemed to be most helpful at the moment. Well, perhaps for grief, uh, caring for that pain of grieving, caring for the pain of loss will help the understanding of it. And of course, the insight into impermanence is the most powerful because it changes forever or, or begins to whittle away our habituated way of, of, of trying to stay away from pain, to avoid pain and turn toward the distraction of what we want. Um, that's different than, as Michelle said, to be able to step back from the overwhelm when, it, when it's too much, when we don't, when we don't, or when we're not able to gauge what we can do, what we're capable of giving, for example, how generous can we be to ourselves or to others? There's degrees of that. And, and then just to recognize that there's a big difference, for example, between prompted and unprompted generosity or compassion. You know, prompted is often when we feel that we have to do something or it's a good to do or we'll get something back. So there's a degree of conditionality there. Whereas unprompted is the, it's that spontaneous, open, generous heart uh, where, where there's no uh, heart, no forethought or afterthought, no sense of being rewarded in, in any way. Uh, so it's being sensitive to your capability right here and now uh, with a parent, you know, if I think of both of my parents, uh, I, I still grieve them 10, 20 years later, you know, it's, it's, it's by degrees. And the more I'm able to uh, and feel their absence or their loss, the more they turn up again. And I remember something wise they said or loving, something loving, something supportive. Uh, it's like in that way that we all recognize that everything is lost, everything is impermanence. The more we understand that, the more awake, the more aware, the more unprompted our actions, and the more ready we are to, to, to step back when we can't do it, when we're tired, when we're too full, when we need a rest. I, I'll just, uh, well, okay. Okay. No, I, there's another something. Yeah, there, I, I see it too. <laughs> you go ahead. I'll okay, read that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she's, I think Caroline, you're saying it, you appreciate Steve's answer and 
Uh, I think that just in terms of what Steve said, that's so important also is besides everything he said was um, with, with the people we have deep karma with, it's something we work with in a lifetime. So I think we all know that some people that we know and care about and love can die and it doesn't have the same impact as other beings and parents <laughs> often or a relationship have that impact. And uh, it's helpful, I think, to, to remember that that grief will come up over a lifetime, but that it will change. That's all I want to add is that I tend to take it in six month segments. So the first six months after someone that dies that I'm very close to and has that impact, I, I figure I'm going to be underwater most of the time and just do your best <laughs> to get through it. And the next six months, it's a little better. And then the next six months is a little better. And then after two years, you tend to feel like um, you're okay again. So um, now that it probably isn't the same for everybody, but I do think it's a good marker. Uh, I think what you say that some days are more difficult than others, and it's like a cloud following you through the day. It, it is like that. That is the truth. You know, you can do everything you can to um, be sad and then distract yourself from it. Be sad and distract yourself from it. But you will be sad a lot. It's just the way grief after someone you really have a deep karma with is. And yeah, I can add one thing is that I live on the big island uh, in Hawaii, but lived in Honolulu for 23 years. And when my sister, one of my sisters died and my dad died, um, I also asked um, Pele to hold it with me, to carry, hold the grief with me. So if you have a relationship, um, with even the earth, Mother Earth, you can ask her to help carry it with you. Like you don't have to feel like you have to hold it all by yourself. Could be a tree that you love. You just ask that tree to hold it with you. They, if you have a relationship, it could be with a feral cat, but other beings often will help you hold it, if you ask. So <laughs> okay. if everything is impermanent, why should we care? <laughs> I'm suspicious. Because there's impermanence, we should care. Exactly. Mortality. Mortality is the big thing. If we if there wasn't mortality, would we care? The more we understand the fragility, vulnerability the instantaneous disappearing nature of ephemeral things, conditioned things. If we really understand it, the heart just opens wide and spontaneously we care or we're generous. 
or we're loving, or we appreciate even brief moments of, of happiness. We feel the joy, the fleeting joys. Or because it's the truth, the mind grows equanimous and peaceful because that's the nature of, that's the truth for everybody. For all sentient life. Do you think so, Sun? I see from this perspective, because like one time like a friend would tell me that since everything is impermanent, why should we care to um, about the furniture? It doesn't uh, make sense. But, um, it can, I can see where it might make sense to some people. And I can see that's also why our planet's in a lot of trouble. Yeah, I think, am I on? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's a really, um, come, coming from a childhood where nobody did care about the furniture, <laughs> I can say that it's um, really helpful to have your home be a place of um, where peop some people are, are taking care of the dishes and the furniture and the whatever. It's like it doesn't have to be expensive by any means, but it, it can, you know, it, whether something is um, there's a few nice things in your home. Nice meaning, I mean, I mean very inexpensive, but uh, it's like when you go to bed at night and you get in bed, it's, it's like to care about that helps you sleep. It's like, I, I guess I can really speak from coming from a situation where uh, I hadn't been in it and learn it and I had to learn how to do that. And um, I really appreciate that it's a, and may, maybe in many ways Upandita taught it to me both. You know, Steve's mother, I think, was good at teaching Steve, but it's like caring about your surroundings uh, brings about a mind that can be calm and settled and it reflects a uh, clear comprehension of purpose. Upandita was always talking about that when. Uh, one time I came in to see him and my hair, I had um, dyed it blue. Uh, and <laughs> oh my God, it was so freaking funny. And he, he looked was like, whoa, you know, and all of my Western friend teachers were appalled. And I went in to see him and he just looked very quiet for a while. And he said, um, monks like to be beautiful too. And it was so incredible, really. It was so moving to me. And he said, when I teach the uh, monks and nuns, the little young ones, I teach them to care about how they shave their heads and I care about how they have their robes and care about the things in their room, how they, how they make their bed and how they care about anything. It's like you feel that in these nunneries and monasteries and the lay people, it's like, the, it, it's, it's all about caring about what you're doing and your relationship with your spoon and your relationship with your glass and your relationship with your friend. It's, it's all about relationship with everything. It's, it's apamada. Apamada is the word. Carefulness. Mindfulness is how you brush your teeth and how you get in your, if you have a car or how you sit down in the bus. It's, uh, you know, this is really important like it's fundamental thank you steve yes. thank you michelle thanks jesse Apamada. <laughs> <laughs>
it's one addendum to that is that under under that um, umbrella of clear comprehension, he spoke of uh, in terms of our things, our property, skill in having and skill in using. The skill in having, um, what's our relationship to what we have, c caring for it, or um, is there an attachment to it? Are we hoarding? Do we want more? Uh, do we just try to collect things? What's our relationship to things and property? Understa understanding those mental qualities, the skillfulness, the skillful means in having things, and then skill in using. Um, is it useful to is it useful to ourselves, and how so? Uh, is it necessary? Is it supportive of our living? Is it useful to others? Uh, is it something that we share with others? How do we use what we have? Is it, is it part of the ecology of our lives and our relationships with our family, our community, with the planet and so forth? We can think in that very simple way, skill of having and skill of using in terms of all things. It's uh, probably time to appreciate the goodness of us all being together and liberating our hearts together and really try to uh, feel the fortification of us, uh, the wisdom, the kindness, the compassion, the empathetic joy and equanimity. Have a great week. <laughs>